Welcome to the CJD Foundation Virtual Conference. We thank our partners, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. And our sponsors, Ionis Pharmaceuticals and Charles River Labs. Tonight, we're pleased to present a panel discussion about diagnosis and caregiving for prion disease patients. Our speakers are Dr. Brian Appleby, Director of National Prion Disease Pathology and Surveillance Center, and Professor, Department of Neurology at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Gregory Day, Associate Professor of Neurology at Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Michael Geshwind, Professor, Memory and Aging Center, University of California, San Francisco. Our panel moderator is Professor Richard Knight, Emeritus Professor of Clinical Neurology, CCBS, University of Edinburgh. Please enter your questions as they occur to you during the panel discussion, and the speakers will address as many as time permits following the panel. And now, our panel. Okay, well, um, welcome to the panel, and uh, you've uh, all been introduced to everybody, uh, and we're going to go through some questions which are based on uh, the kind of problems that uh, present to families and patients. And certainly these kind of questions come up on many of the uh, um, uh, CJD support group uh, phone lines and uh, emails. And basically we're gonna divide it roughly into sort of two or three areas. Um, the first being diagnosis. So maybe I'll probably start with uh, Mike, if that's all right. And of course, um, the diagnosis can be a protracted and sometimes a bit of a difficult business. Would you like to briefly summarize how the diagnosis is made so that families understand it uh, and why it does take time? So for the sporadic form of disease and also even for the genetic, there are a constellation of symptoms that occur. And we now know that there are, in many patients, that there are prodrome of symptoms, work that some of the people on the call, the CJD Foundation have, have done, have shown that in the early phases of the disease, there might be symptoms that aren't clearly attributable to the neurologic system, to the brain. For instance, um, or, or, or might not be actually uh, the type of symptoms that we think are outwardly neurologic. For instance, psychiatric symptoms often can be the very first symptoms, and they might be subtle, depression, anxiety um, might, be, uh, might be the first features. The CJD Foundation, in some of their surveys, and we've also supported that with our patients, found that a dry cough uh, or a non-productive cough that doesn't bring up sputum in a reasonable minority of patients is the very first symptom and it can occur months before the onset of clear neurologic symptoms. And clear neurologic symptoms usually are cognitive impairment, memory problems, and then motor dysfunction, problems with coordination, problems moving limbs, problems with balance. Um, and then some people will get myoclonus, usually later in the disease where they get jerking of the body, a sudden jerking of the shoulders or the limb. Um, and, and other people can have visual symptoms. So any symptom that's attributable to the brain can be the first symptoms of CJD. So that can be a clue. Um, the other things that can be helpful are once a doctor suspects that there is something neurologic going on, they, of, uh, they often will have the patient have a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture. And the same two names for the same thing where we take a sample of spinal fluid. And there are tests that we can do um, that can be very helpful. Many of those tests, uh, Dr. Appleby's group at the National Print Disease Pathology Surveillance Center does. And then the uh, electroencephalogram or a brainwave test can show findings that are suggestive of CJD. And a lot of um, my work at UCSF has, um, and people elsewhere have shown that the a brain MRI, there are certain sequences and certain findings 
that are virtually diagnostic for the disease and also can be very helpful. I mean, maybe if I can pick up on that from discussions that I've had with families, I, I mean, the prodromal symptoms you mentioned, I think, are, are it's quite a difficult area. And certainly when they've been looked at in case control studies, comparing uh, those early symptoms uh, that CJD patients and families report compared with other illnesses like diabetes or um, pneumonia or, or whatever, um, you get very similar profiles. In other words, those symptoms are extremely nonspecific. So I think it's important that families realize that if those are genuine pro prodromal symptoms of CJD, they can be due to many other illnesses. And Absolutely. Very, um, uh, you, it's a very important point. And so they're very non-specific and they're not, they're not going to probably lead to an earlier diagnosis. You then mentioned on uh, the, the neurological problems. And I guess from my point of view as a neurologist, the key thing is that um, you know, uh, dysphasia, uh, anxiety, depression, um, uh, ataxia, cognitive impairment, they're very non-specific symptoms that are, are common to many other illnesses. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that the diagnosis does take time because you, you do need to explore these other possibilities, I guess. Yes, and but once a doctor sees that a patient has those symptoms, then that should and especially if the symptoms have come on somewhat rapidly, because one of the differences in general with most forms of CJD is that it's very rapid and that there's a rapid progression of from one symptom to the next. And whereas in CJD, those symptoms will occur over, um, change over days, weeks, um, sometimes months. In most dementias, they, those symptoms might be separated by months or years. So the progression um, is a very important thing to tell a physician, okay, I need to do further tests. I need to do an MRI and to look at the spinal fluid for markers that might support the diagnosis of prion disease or CJD. I, I, so I think really your answer is centered on two very important factors for families that say their diagnosis is done late in the illness. And the first is the non-specific presentation, um, or at least other illnesses have to be considered that may be treatable as well. And secondly, the rapidity of the illness progression not only gives you a clue it might be CJD, but it also means that time goes by very quickly and the patient is quite often very ill when the diagnosis is made. It's true. Our, uh, we did a study that found that our cohort uh, is about two thirds of the way through their disease course yeah. um, before the uh, con uh, convincing diagnosis of CJD is made. And I think that's why it's really important that if a physician is not that familiar with what's going on and doesn't really have a diagnosis, referral to some of the people who are on this call, some of the physicians on this call to, an ex to experts who might be, be able to better identify the etiology or the cause of the symptoms. I think you're right. And, and interestingly, although we've got much better at diagnosis and got a lot more diagnostic tests, the time to diagnosis has remained relatively constant throughout quite a number of years. And I think it's because the early phases are relatively nonspecific, I think and the, the illness progresses so rapidly. So uh, care, I thought that the first thing we could talk about, because it comes up very often in the CJD support uh, um, approaches, is, is how to deal with various symptoms. So I thought I might go to Brian next. Um, two things that come up quite often are how to deal with aggression or paranoia in patients, which certainly sometimes develops, and also how to deal with people who get sort of rather sometimes fixed delusions or certainly um, very confused ideas. Do you have any comments on the management of those, Brian? Yeah, I, I think they can be um, kind of tricky. So first off, agitation, it's almost always in response to something, right? So um, notably, there, there really is no medication per se for agitation and people with CJD or any other form of dementia. So the first thing to do is try to figure out why the person is agitated. Um, so just looking at the basic functions of life, is the person constipated? Uh, do they have to go to the bathroom? Are they hungry? Uh, those sorts of things are, I think, often overlooked 
um, and quite easy to manage and you can do so without medications. Um, other things include de depression can be very common in any brain illness. And uh, of course that can be treatable, uh, but in some people with brain illnesses, it looks like agitation instead of uh, sadness and tearfulness. Um, you had mentioned delusions. So delusions is a, a fixed false idiosyncratic belief. And um, oftentimes in people that have memory problems, it's due to their memory problem. So, um, you know, a loved one may complain that someone is stealing from him or her when really they're just forgetting where they put something. A medication is not going to help with that necessarily, right? That's due to their cognitive impairment. So it's important to look at all these things before you, you, you even consider using medication. Um, there are medications that can be used and we try to be as specific to the symptom as possible. If there's an agitated depression, obviously an antidepressant. There are some uh, antipsychotic medications that we really like to avoid if we can, because it can cause other motor symptoms. Uh, but you know, there are certain specific medications that we can use at low doses and you frequently evaluate and increase the dose as needed, but sometimes you can take it off rather quickly thereafter. Yeah, one of the questions that I've been asked many times um, is, uh, you know, the person affected may have some ideas like somebody's uh, alive rather than dead, or somebody's having an affair with somebody else. Uh, and the, the families ask, how is it best to deal with that? You know, should you argue with them? Should you try to correct their views? Should you go along with it? Uh, is there a danger in going along with it? Yeah, I think it depends on the person in the situation, but um, oftentimes it's due to a memory problem and you can use that memory problem to your advantage. If you choose to not explain the situation and move on and distract to something else, oftentimes that solves the problem. So, you know, depending on the person and what the situation is, you may decide to just move on to something else. And that's much more helpful than trying to explain that, you know, so-and-so is in the hospital or passed away repeatedly. And one final point about Brian is, is um, sleep difficulties. What, what, do, what do you suggest about that? Because, you know, sometimes you get these difficulties where people are not to sleep at night and very agitated. Um, and of course, the carers are trying to sleep. Yeah, sleep is extremely important. And like you said, Richard, not just for the patient, but for the caregiver, especially. And of course, that's a very common symptom in, in CJD. Um, so we really do try to um, try to get the patient as sleeping as best we can. Um, that can involve medication, but keep in mind, you have to keep the patient awake during the day as best as possible as well. So if you keep them act, active and engaged, they're going to sleep better at night. Um, and again, we can use uh, sleeping medications, but we definitely have a preference of what medications we use for that because many of those medications can cause other side effects that we'd like to avoid. If you have, Greg, maybe you could uh, uh, now, because I was going to ask you a little bit about the kind of therapies or support that might be available to people, what you think is beneficial. And when you get questions from Panman, is it, it's partly about what you might call more standard things like physiotherapy, OT, speech and language therapy, um, but also things like, you know, aromatherapy, music therapy, uh, and less standard therapies. What would you say about that? Well, I, I think what, what Brian was, was suggesting, and I agree with all of those suggestions, is the, the key is if we can find a strategy to manage behaviors and promote function that doesn't require us to give medications that are going to have complications, we should look for those strategies. And so when it comes to approaches like music therapy and aromatherapy, if they're having the right effect on the patient, if, if it's leading to a period of more lucency, of relaxation, reducing agitation, increasing engagement, we know those methods, those methods work. They work for select individuals. It can promote a healthy relationship and can increase the bond between carers and between patients. And so I think we're all, we're all for it. If we're looking for really conclusive studies that show that that approach is better than another approach, we're not gonna find that. Those are hard studies to do. And each approach needs to be tailored to the individual patients. And although we on the call, I think know a lot about this disease, and we eventually learn a lot about our patients. We're never going to learn more about our patients than what 
the people in the room with them already know. And so this is really where that partnership comes in, comes in play. And the partnership between the patient, between their carer, and between their medical team as well. And so drawing, drawing on that and enhancing that can be a really useful, useful strategy. I like to ask questions about the things that our patients enjoy, and we try to find ways to connect them with joy and hope that that's also going to bring ease to the caregiver, allow them to do their job a little bit better. I think other approaches to therapy, the conventional ones like physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy can be helpful, but they really need to be goal-directed. If our expectation is that by enrolling someone in intensive physical therapy, multiple hours a day, we're going to stave off progression of this disease, well, unfortunately, that's just not a reasonable expectation. And in fact, we can probably have the opposite effect. We can increase burden on the caregiver, increase burden on the patient, and not see those gains that we need. If though, by participating in therapy, we can help our patients to be more engaged in their own self-care, enabling them to transfer longer, to be more involved in feeding and self-care, and again, to maintain function, we should be doing that with that goal in mind. And I think the same comes true with occupational therapy, speech therapy, learning methods to improve and promote swallowing, I think can also enhance quality of life, can improve communication. And so engaging that broad care team, it can be very, very useful, very influential. When I'm sending patients to our allied health professionals, um, it's not often that we're gonna find a community-based therapist that has a lot of experience with CJD. But we will have community therapists that have a lot of experience with other neurological injuries, so like stroke or like brain injury. And some of those skills translate in my experience. And so we can build that connection, uh, working with the clinical team, with our patient carers who know a lot about this disease. We can hopefully educate those to provide the best, best care and help people benefit from these extra services. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, obviously, two issues that uh, I, I think about in this, and I, maybe before I turn to Michael, I'll just ask the pair of you, uh, Brian and Gregory, to, to comment on it. I mean, firstly, because of the rapidity of progression, if you're going to get help, you need to get it very quickly. And the needs of patients change very quickly. What's appropriate for somebody one week might not be appropriate in two weeks time. And so I guess that's fairly straightforward. Leaving that aside, I'm really picking you up, Greg, on your last point, because my own feeling about this is that see people say, well, there's not a lot of people with expertise in CJD. And I wonder how much you need that expertise, because a lot of the management principles that you both of you have talked about are common to many brain diseases. It's not specifically to targeted to CJD. Would, would you both agree with that? I'd 100% agree with that. I think, as Michael pointed out earlier on, the symptoms and the way the disease presents, it, can, it comes from whatever area the brain is affected. And, and so as long as we're dealing with professionals who have some exposure to neurological disease, in particular neurological disease that affect cortex, uh, so stroke, Alzheimer's disease, other forms of neurodegenerative disease, we can draw on that expertise to really enhance the care of our, of our patients with CJD, even without that individual maybe having a firm knowledge of CJD. But I think, Richard, you hit on the other point. What they do need to understand uh, is that this disease does progress rapidly. And so a patient who's failing to respond or stabilize with treatment isn't necessarily a patient who's not actively participating. It's a patient with a really tough disease. And so helping the therapist understand that, helping them to have that flexibility that you just described, realizing that the needs of that patient may change even between visits, I think can, can really maximize the potential for benefit from that care. Okay, and I, I really want to turn to Mike uh, in a minute, but I just want to clear up one other point that comes up quite a lot about swallowing. What should you do? Uh, I mean, I know it's obviously the case of the individual uh, uh, situation, but what do you think about nasogastric tubes, gastrostomies, other methods of feeding in, in, in swallowing situations? Brian, do you want to comment on that? Or do... Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's very family specific. Um, you know, I think it's a discussion to have with the family, especially with hospice, if they're involved, regarding what the primary endpoint is for their loved one. And it becomes a discussion of quality of life versus quantity of life. And uh, oftentimes those types of interventions are much more geared towards quantity of life. 
And if the family really wants to preserve quality of life and that's what's important to them, um, then obviously we would recommend that they don't necessarily go those routes. But you know, every family is very, very different. Every uh, patient and family's aims are different. So it has to be tailored to what their priorities are. So, I mean, if we're summarizing all of that, we're talking about very much tailoring the care to the individual patient, individual family. It's an individual matter, but expertise in general in neurological disease, particularly brain disease, is probably useful. Um, and we don't necessarily need to have ultra experts and CJD for, for reasonable care. Uh, Mike, I just wondered, the issue that comes up uh, uh, quite often is myoclonus, and quite a lot of families are distressed by this and, and want it treated, although in my experience it doesn't necessarily cause or problems or suffering. Um, what do you think about treatment of myoclonus? Yeah, um, yeah, Richard, so I'd like to, I'll answer, that's a great question, and just to add um, on to the previous question, um, I guess my practice is, is a little bit um, more, I actively try to get the families not to do life prolonging measures like nasogastric tubes. I, by asking them, would your loved one want to live like this? And what Brian said about quantity versus quality is so important. And I think that's the, a big thing. And, and to let families know that it's okay to be focusing on quality of life uh, and not quantity. And to let them know that that's okay, is that, that's a really important conversation to have. And I'm so glad that Brian brought that up. So my clonus. My clonus. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm completely with you on that point, is that my clonus looks really bothersome to the patients, but a lot of times the patients aren't even aware of it, particularly if it's the later stage of disease just like they may not be aware of what's going on around them, they may not be aware of the myoclonus that's jerking. It, it's often much more disturbing for their loved ones to watch and for, for them than the patient. So if often when I'm, um, and the only, what I tell patients is that I'll treat the myoclonus if the patient says it bothers them or if it's interfering with the care of, the patient, if they're so much myoclonus, uh, we can't turn them, bathe them. Um, if they're still feeding, it's interrupting. Then there's a medical reason to do it. But otherwise, I try to not treat it. Um, and if I do treat it, I let the family know I'm not treating the patient, I'm treating the family. And just so they understand that. And there are medications that uh, often can help with the myoclonus. Um, and we, we use them in exceptional circumstances. So, um, yeah, you've, you've uh, said that you're, you're treating not only the patient, but the family. So maybe I'll turn to Brian now and talk about another thing that comes up. Uh, carers who exhaust themselves, really, looking after the patient, feel the need to be there all the time and how they get respite and how they look after themselves. Do you want to say anything about that, Brian? Or? Yes, I, I think everyone on the call here, you know, has a fair amount of experience with CJD and other dementias. We, we all realize that there's more than two patients, you know, in the room, right? There's the patient on the chart, but then there's the caregiver as well. And in many ways, uh, as the disease goes on, we're actually uh, caring more for the caregiver than we are for the actual patient. And one of the reasons for that is the patient's only going to do as well as the caregiver is. Um, so I think it is our responsibility to equally care for the caregiver as you would the patient. And part of that is helping them understand that they need to take care of themselves in order to properly care for their loved one. Um, and that can be hard. And uh, I think one of the ways the CJD Foundation has been so helpful is there's a lot of examples of, of carers that come in and talk to other carers about how they learn that lesson that they do have to take time out for themselves. Um, and it allows them to be better caregivers and you know to, to stay well themselves. Sure, yeah, that's, um, I think it's a very important point. Um, I guess, um, you know, obviously towards the, the end of the disease, end of life. There's lots of discussions about how that is managed. Um, I don't know, do you want to say something about that, Greg? Uh, 
management of end of life for, for carers. People ask quite a lot of questions about that. I must say that in terms of suffering, I quite often feel that uh, at the end, it's the, the carer who's suffering more than the patient. I, I think that's a very accurate statement. But oddly, I think when we reflect on the end of this disease, it actually calls more attention to why it's important to make a diagnosis as early as possible in this disease. In fact, many of, much of which we've, we've been discussing heads back to that. The earlier that we recognize this disorder, the earlier that we as clinicians can provide patients and their family members with an accurate diagnosis and accurate information, the sooner we can begin to plan for management and plan to address these challenges that we're discussing while hopefully integrating a lot of patient feedback. I think what families struggle the most with, and this goes for many of the things that we're just discussing, is this, this fervent desire to do what's best for their loved one and to represent them and allow them to have and maintain dignity and have a death that is what they would want, if, if, that, if that term applies and makes sense. And so the earlier that we make that diagnosis, the earlier we engage in that discussion, the sooner we can start to plan. And I think maybe where it's been most successful for me is really some of those difficult cases where the patient has a lot of awareness about what's going on. We're able to talk about the diagnosis and provide that opportunity for discussions that otherwise might never happen, where the patient themselves can tell their partner, perhaps their adult children, what they want. Uh, what do they want with respect to a feeding tube? What do they want with, for treatment of non-bothersome cosmetic symptoms like myoclonus? How do they want to deal with issues pertaining to swallowing and ultimately where do they want to where do they want to pass uh, is it at home is it in a hospice care facility is it under other situations once we have that clarity i think enacting that plan uh, is something that that people really can get behind and have that knowledge that we're doing this with the patient's perspective in in mind and certainly that can make things easier for us there can always be bumps in the bumps in the road we can encounter symptoms and signs and problems that we may not have anticipated, whether that be, say, a seizure that could require a different kind of management or an counter an, an infection that could, could come along that might need to be, maybe warrants treatment and further discussion. Maybe, maybe there is a lot of agitation, so much so that care at home is not the best option for the patient and the caregiver. And so those are things that we have to work as a healthcare team to address. I think the best partners that I've had in that beyond the patient and their family is usually working with our local hospice providers, uh, having them engaged, accessing services that they have available that often allows care to be provided in the home setting, sometimes in a, uh, in a hospice facility setting, and even in other cases, still sometimes in hospital. And so preparing for that plan taking it step by step and then maintaining that flexibility and having access to resources to respond to the needs of the patient and the family are, I think, the keys to how we navigate the end of life situation. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm informed that we're running very close to time. So I, I had one last question, which uh, inevitably comes up all the time, and that's about the possibility of treatment. And uh, so uh, I, I think maybe I'll ask each of you in turn, um, uh, to answer that question, um, bearing in mind that I think we have to try to give families hope, but at the same time we have to try to give them realism as well. So uh, Mike, um, what, what do you think, what are the real possibilities of treatment? And you, if you wish you can divide your answer into prevention in those people at risk like genetic mutation carriers and treatment of something like sporadic CJD, which I think is a different kettle of fish. Yes, so I, I think the most promising thing for prevention at this moment are therapies that are, uh, are sort of genetic therapies um, in which we're trying to reduce the amount of the abnormal prion protein in the brain by reducing the normal prion protein, the substrate. So in prion disease, you have... We all have normal prion proteins that let's say have a certain shape or throughout the brain. And then you have your misfolded protein, the prion protein called the prion. And these two come together and you get two misfolded proteins. Um, and then these two come in contact with two normal ones. You get four uh, misfolded ones. And what we could do now, not just for prion disease, but for other neurologic and other diseases 
is we can, if we reduce the normal amount of prion protein, then there's less protein to be converted into the misfolded disease causing form. And there are ways of doing this now where clear, we can, at the moment. Mike, you're talking about not reducing the prion protein in the whole of the population to prevent this disease, are you? You're talking about people at risk. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, thank you for that, Claire. Yes, I'm only talking about either people at risk or people who actually have the disease, um, pr presumably people who have early mild disease, by reducing their... In animal studies, it's been shown that if you reduce the amount of prion protein, let's say in a mouse, in an animal. And you can, there are many ways to do this now. Um, in some ways we can genetically modify a mouse. Other ways we can actually inject pieces of uh, artificial DNA into the spinal fluid and it, can, it gets up to the brain, it bathes the brain and it gets in there and it reduces the amount of normal prion protein made and animal data um, has shown uh, from experiments have shown that that can uh, extend or de uh, delay the onset of the disease or extend a person's life. Um, and the actual genetic experiments done by Giovanna Malucci in the UK, she actually showed um, in, in mice that you could actually greatly delay the onset of the disease and you could actually get uh, animals, mice to, to improve. Now, we don't yet have that technology to do exactly what she did in people, but the, the idea of, of reducing the amount of protein made by, by modifying the, um, the RNA, you have DNA to RNA to protein, and we want to reduce the protein, and we can do that by removing the RNA or blocking the RNA, that middle step. And there are ways now we're doing that for spinal muscular atrophy. It's in clinic. There are thousands of patients who've gotten that uh, treatment in the United States. We inject artificial DNA into the spinal fluid and we can really improve that disease. So that to me is a hope that might work. It might be the earlier we give it, the better. Um, and so that's why it might be most beneficial and pre-symptomatic uh, people and those people who are mutation carriers, but it also might work in people who are early symptomatic, be they sporadic, be they genetic or iatrogenic. Um, but yeah. those I mean, are so you're saying there's hope there, but not immediate treatment on the horizon, immediate horizon. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Um, w w the, it, it's expected that these yeah. these trials in patients might start as early as 2022. And so far, it looks like the experiment, these experimental trials might start with people who are pre-symptomatic genetic prion disease. My hope is actually we won't just start with that group, but we'll actually start with people who are early symptomatic to see at the same time if we can actually see benefit. So that's just one of the methods that we're looking at. Um, and there are other methods that laboratories are looking at. Uh, non-genetic ways to reduce prion protein, also other ways just to support the brain in general. Uh, I'm running treatment trials in a half a dozen other neurodegenerative diseases. If those treatments work in those diseases, those treatments are relatively non-specific and they might work in other brain diseases such as CJD. So I hold out hope for those as well. Okay. Um, I mean, I think early symptomatic disease may be possible, but how many people with sporadic CJD at the time of diagnosis really have early symptomatic disease is yeah. questionable. But Brian, what, sorry, what do you think? Well, I already talked about this in the earlier um, talk that's recorded, so I don't want to take too much time up and I want to hear what Greg has to say, but basically I'll summarize in that I, I think prion disease is an interesting disease paradigm that probably allows it to be um, kind of exploited by these new genetic treatments. And I agree that early uh, people at risk probably stand the greatest um, uh, chance of improving or getting a benefit from these treatments. But sporadic CJD is always gonna be intimately tied to timely diagnosis, right? And that's gonna be difficult. So. And uh, there's obviously the other question as to how long the disease process is going on for before symptoms arise, which is 
a very difficult one of the questions which has bedeviled Alzheimer's, I think, to some degree, at least in my opinion. Anyway, uh, Greg. Well, I'll, I'll pick up sort of right where you left off there, Richard. I, I think we actually, we need more investment in the science of, of CJD and of prion disease. And I think you've got people on this call who have made it you know, much of their life's work and who have substantially advanced our chances of finding a meaningful meaningful disease modifying treatment in this disease and appreciate everything that Michael said about the potential for some of these new therapies coming down the line to help families with genetic forms of, of CJD. But without investment in, in research, without an understanding and better understanding of when this disease actually starts in the brain. And so we're not going to be able to identify those patients who might benefit from some novel treatments. And so I think the solution here is not to, to hypothesize a bunch of uh, a bunch of medications that are in existence and randomly try them in our patients, but it's really to get to get further into the science to better understand this disease and then to come up with some thoughtful clinical trials, formal research studies that will give us data. And even if the data shows us that that treatment didn't work, a well-designed trial I think always helps us down the road with the next the next study and the next steps. And that's that's what we need here. Um, I think one very interesting study would be trying to hone in on that question that you raised. When does the disease start? Can we use available biomarkers, either neuroimaging or biofluid, like spinal fluid biomarkers, to understand when these changes are, are detectable? Uh, and perhaps doing that in populations that already exist, uh, like through our large National Alzheimer's Disease Research Center program, screening available CSF specimens to identify if we can recognize protein signatures of misformed prions in spinal fluid be a really interesting and compelling project. I think we have the technology in some ways to do this. We don't necessarily have the funding yet. I think we have the interest. And so taking those next steps is what I certainly hope to see in the next few years. Well, thank you. Is there anything that each of you just want to say as a final sentence? Anything in particular? Well, the only thing I was gonna add is that, you know, I, I've been in the field for about 20 years and I've been following genetic families now for, for that whole time. And I've been bringing them in on a, uh, it was on an irregular basis, trying to do exactly what Greg was talking about. Uh, I'm trying to find biomarkers that change early in the disease before onset of symptoms. And I finally got funding from the National Institutes of Health for a five-year grant where I'm bringing in families with the most common mutations. Um, and we're bringing them in on an annual basis for a two-day visit. Uh, I have three people in my research unit right now as we're talking um, uh, from a single family who um, are, uh, we're, we're, they spend two days with us and we're trying to identify biomarkers that might be changing early in the disease so that when we, so that we can better test the treatments as they become available. Um, so we'll know this spinal fluid biomarker begins to change five years before onset or this MRI changes occurs at X point, even before there are clinical symptoms. So in my mind, that gives me a lot of hope. If we can identify these biomarkers, we can be treating people at well before the onset of symptoms. So hopefully they will never develop symptoms. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, uh, well, I think everyone seems to be, I think, in agreement that in the, the most immediate um, outcome for treatment is likely to be prevention of disease and genetic mutation character uh, people, uh, but carriers, yeah. But the other things are equally very important. So um, I think that we're going to wrap up there. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, Brian and uh, Greg, for all of the answers uh, that you've given to these questions. Uh, they're, they're difficult matters. And we're now going to go live to uh, the attenders to see what questions they have to pose. Hello. So I hope that uh, um, everyone thought that that was a, a good question and answer session. Um, but we are now live and uh, there's been quite a number of questions typed in, which I'm going to address to the panel. Um, there's a, a big cluster of questions about what I would say was the cause of CJD. So uh, although um, we need to talk about the care aspects as well, I thought we'd better address those issues. Um, I think there's a little bit of uh, confusion in the questions, perhaps, um, relating to the fact 
that uh, uh, that uh, we have a normal prion protein and uh, of course a normal prion protein gene we all have that so i thought what i'd want to do is first of all ask brian if he could uh, succinctly go over the types of cjd and and the causes sure so i um also would recommend that you visit the CJD Foundation's website because they also do a great overview of this um, that's written for lay people. But essentially there's uh, four main causes of, of CJD. By far the most common is what we call sporadic CJD. It makes up about 85% of all cases. Um, we don't know exactly how it occurs, but we think it's probably a spontaneous mutation of the normal prion protein that occurs in an individual that's associated with age. Um, but there's reasons to believe that if not all of them, the vast majority of them are not acquired. About 10% in our country are due to a genetic mutation in that prion protein gene, and uh, under 1% are due to an acquired infection, whether it be through medical procedures, which we would call our atrogenic CJD, or through eating meat contaminated with mad cow disease, which in people we would call variant CJD. I mean, the term sporadic CJD is used because the disease occurs sporadically without any obvious uh, environmental or other cause, just randomly in the population. I think that's the name of it. So uh, if I could turn to perhaps Mike and ask him some of the questions in relation to cause in genetic uh, cases, there are a range of questions about this. But I think one of them is uh, if somebody does carry a mutation, they have obviously carried that all their life and yet they become ill at a certain time. And I think a couple of the questions were really probably getting at why somebody becomes ill at a certain time. If the mutation is there, is the disease dormant in some way and then gets triggered by something? And as an adjunct to that, uh, if somebody's uh, relative died of CJD, how do they go about ascertaining whether it's genetic or not? Yeah, those are two really important points. So. What, what I think the most common thinking is in the genetic form of prion disease is that a person who is born with a mutation in the prion protein gene is making prion proteins. You have two copies of every gene. So you could be making copies from the normal copy of the gene or the mutated copy. The protein that's coming from the mutated copy has a small error in it. That error makes that prion protein more susceptible to misfolding. In the sporadic form of the disease, you have two normal proteins, presumably, and they somewhere along the way are billions and billions of proteins. A few of them misfold, and that starts the disease process. In the genetic form of the disease, a portion of your prion proteins already have that, an error in them that make them more susceptible to misfolding. So it's a little bit easier for them to misfold. What might be happening is that as we age, our body's ability to clear out proteins that are misshapen or don't function well, our body has a system for clearing out, a gar basically sort of a garbage disposal system for misshapen proteins. But as we age, just like many other parts of our body, that system doesn't work as well. That might allow some of these misshapen proteins to accumulate. And if you get a sufficient number of them, then the disease can start if they're not cleared out quickly enough. That's sort of our working model, one working model for how the genetic prion disease uh, occurs. Um, I forgot your... Um, well, if, if you've got a relative with CJD, yes. how do you find out if it's... Yeah, and how do you get the diagnosis yeah. and uh, how you, whether you're at risk yourself? Right. So um, if a... The, the genetic prion diseases are what we call autosomal dominant, meaning autosomal means it's not on your sex chromosome. It's um, on another one of your 22 other chromosomes. And for the prion gene, it's on chromosome 20. And which is not the X or the Y chromosome, which means that men or women can equally get it. There's no difference in, in that. And we can test for the, if somebody has a mutation by a simple blood test um, is probably the easiest way to do it. And there are 
labs in every country, in most countries that will do it, there are labs in the US. Um, I, I recommend always sending it to the lab that Dr. Appleby runs at the National Print Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. I think they have the most experience in doing that testing. And I've had errors at labs um, outside of that center that when I sent it to the National Print Disease Pathology Surveillance Center, they gave the right diagnosis. So I always like to send my test there. Um, if somebody, if, if there's a first degree relative who has prion disease, then basically each family member is essentially, uh, each first degree relative is at 50% risk. So if I have a parent who has the disease, every single child is 50% at risk. And then all the next generation will be 25% at risk until the middle generation is tested. So if I know that I'm a mutation carrier and my parent was a mutation carrier, then um, I, if I have the mutation, then I'm essentially 100% at risk for carrying the mutation, I have it. And then my children would be at 50% risk and their children would be at 25% risk because we don't know whether they have the mutation or not. Uh, there's a 50-50 chance. If my child finds out that they do have the mutation, then their children would each be at 50% risk. So it's basically a 50-50 uh, risk. Um, and um, But you're talking really, obviously it, about genetic forms of the disease there, just to be clear. The first to you just, know, Yes, genetic. I'm only talking about the genetic form, which are uh, about 10 to 15% of all the forms of disease. And it, it can get very complicated, these discussions. So that's why uh, we, we have a full-time genetic counselor. It's always important um, to make sure that um, it, the, these genetic questions, whether it could be genetic prion disease, is discussed with a clinician who understands the genetics of prion disease and a genetics counselor. Whenever we send the genetic test for genetic prion disease, and we test every patient with suspected prion disease to see if they have the genetic form, they always go through genetic counseling session before we send the test. And when we get the result, we do it with a counseling session. Um, I, I guess it's rather important to emphasize that the 50-50 chance is for every child. So if you have four children, it doesn't mean that two of them will have the disease and two won't. Every single child, as it occurs, has a 50-50 chance. And I think sometimes people misunderstand that. Uh, Greg, perhaps I'd just, I want to turn to care actually, but uh, there are a couple of points. Uh, and, and the first is that someone's asked, if you do have a mutation, do you necessarily get disease? So it really goes on to this funny issue of penetrance and so right. on, an age of onset. Do you want to comment on that? No, certainly. I think Dr. Geshwin did a good job of laying out the model by which we understand genetic prion diseases. And if you are a carrier of a mutation, I think the expectation is that if you live long enough, you're, if there's enough time for the for the prion proteins, the normal prion proteins to begin misfolding, knowing they're more likely to misfold, that is likely to occur and there are likely to be symptoms of this, of this disease. Um, not everyone will develop, develop this disease. I think some people would, could, uh, could pass away from other causes before symptoms emerged. There may, uh, there, I think we always allow for the possible exception, what we would call escapees, people who have a mutation have a risk and for one reason or another, don't develop the disease. We don't often get to involve those individuals in research, but when we do, when we have a, somebody who has the variant and doesn't develop the disease, that can really provide some, some very important information for this disease that can help the care of other patients and understanding the factors that allow somebody to be resilient or resistant to a mutation. And some of the research programs that go on here in the United States, I think one of the most important ones in a, a very well uh, designed research program at, at UCSF with Dr. Geshwin uh, is informing that and, and giving us uh, new information from this select group of individuals, again, the minority, 10 to 15% with this disease who have a genetic mutation, but from that group of people, we may be able to learn more that applies to the broader group of people with the sporadic disease. Uh, and hopefully, uh, as we talked about in the pre-feed, what we were listening to before, hopefully developing treatments that work in patients with the genetic disease to prevent the onset of the disease, and then maybe transitioning those treatments to other at-risk individuals. 
Well, thank you. I, I'm keen to get on to care, but there, there does seem to be quite a lot of questions around causation. And I, I think the one of the things I've ob observed is that these diseases like sporadic CJD, which occur out of the blue, uh, um, people do tend to look in their life for some kind of event that they could retrospectively think, oh, that what uh, maybe caused it. And there's been a lot of studies done on this, and it's not been found that there's any very particular events that precipitate sporadic CJD. But uh, there have been questions in the UK, and I noticed that there have been happening in the uh, States as well about the possibility of COVID vaccination being a precipitant for the disease. I, I personally don't think there's any evidence for that. Brian, do you want to comment on that briefly? Actually, you know, it's a very, very common question. And uh, we did address this a little bit in an earlier recorded talk with Dr. Ryan Maddox from CDC. Um, it's after his pre-recorded video, so pretty much right after it. So I would encourage everyone to look at that. Um, it is something we're tracking because we do get calls. Um, you know, we expect uh, actually a fair amount of people to develop CJD that have gotten one of the vaccines, uh, and especially right after they've gotten one of the vaccines. And that's just because of the scale of the pandemic and people getting vaccines, especially in the older population. We're going to expect a certain amount of those people to develop CJD anyway. Um, but biologically, there's not a whole lot of reason to believe that it would trigger the disease. Um, and again, I would encourage you to, to look at that video with Dr. Ryan Maddox. I mean, obviously, if you develop any illness uh, out of the blue, uh, you might well have had some event in your life beforehand, whether it be emotional, traumatic, or another illness, or vaccination, or a treatment that you might be tempted to think is the cause, but it, it could just be natural coincidence, of course. Um, the next question that I was going to turn to is more about care. Um, and um, it's really to do with, again, um, people with aggression or difficult behavior and um, patients refusing care or help, not wanting to have their teeth cleaned, not wanting to have showers, uh, not wanting to uh, be looked after. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe Brian, do you want to answer that in, in the first instance? It's probably as a psychiatrist up your street, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it pretty common and it can be quite stressful for the caregiver as well and as well for the patient too, depending on how the caregiver decides to deal with it. And um, it is very much an individual basis. And I can't emphasize enough that in, in patients who are agitated and that they do resist some care, it's very important to pick your battles. Um, there are some things that absolutely need to be done and should be done in a certain time frame, And then there are some things that you can let slide. Um, an example of that is you don't have to shower every day. And if uh, that's a huge uh, source of contention, it may be you know, best not to pursue that. Um, so pick your battles wisely. Um, also, you know, try to uh, do things that are enjoyable to the patient um, that may actually lead them in a better mood before you try to do something like that. Um, many of our patients have cognitive impairment and memory problems. They may actually forget later on, so it's good to keep trying as well, um, but not to force the issue if they're kind of fighting back. So it's repetitive trying, um, moving on to other things if needed, and of course, picking your battles wisely. And in relation to another aspect of care, I don't know, Greg, whether you want to answer it. I mean, the question of agitated patients in hospitals or hospices being restrained. Uh, usually people say, well, they get up and wander around and there's a risk of falling. And the whole issue of restraint and how useful or upsetting it is. Yeah, I think there's a, a great theme in the in the set of questions here. And, and certainly it pains, I think, all of us that care very much for patients with CJD and seeing the care of patients improve. It pains us to to read these experiences in outside centers. With CJD, as with every neurologic disease, there's a benefit to expertise. There's a benefit to 
getting to see people who know the disease, who can anticipate some of those challenges, who can motivate and uh, empower their teams and family members to provide optimal care. And uh, frankly, that doesn't exist at all, at all centers. I, I think most people on the call can probably appreciate that. There is a call for more education. There is a need for educating other providers, and that's something that we try to do from our academic centers with the publications that we put out with the research that we that we put on. There's a need for family members to get involved in their local communities and opportunities for them to educate. And of course, the CJD Foundation is doing outstanding work in that area, as are many other patient-oriented organizations. But when it comes to the individual patient, I think family members, our carers, who are the greatest advocates for our patients in hospital. Getting that diagnosis can be really important to understand what's going on, to answer those questions, to unlock valuable resources like hospice care that may allow that care to be provided at home and to get the patients out of that acute care environment where sometimes the focus is a little bit different. I think the inpatient side, there's a lot of moving parts. There's bells and whistles that go off at all hours of the day, and that can increase agitation. And nurses, doctors, the medical professionals aren't lying. Patients that are agitated are at great risk of falling and injuring themselves, and hospitals want to avoid that. I think we all appreciate that restraints uh, and chemical restraints through medications can lead to other complications. And so we want to minimize that when we can. So if it's patient has to be cared for in hospital, we're going to try to do that through behavioral interventions, hopefully finding a hospital in a care environment where family members can be present, having that one continuing factor, that person that they recognize that they can stay connected with, minimizing excess medications, minimizing restraints when needed, and really working on that next step plan about where can we go from here where we have more control over the environment, where it's an environment that may be more conducive, soothing, reassuring for the patient and, uh, and can help to advance, advance care in the direction it needs to go. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it certainly is distressing when you hear stories of poor care. And I was rather struck by somebody saying that uh, in the chat that uh, education of caregivers needs to be uh, increased uh, so that they can give better care and also learn how to listen to families. And it does kind of seem to me to be a recurrent theme that we're not talking here necessarily about deficiencies in CJD care. We're talking about deficiencies in care, full stop, because our after all, many patients are agitated or may fall or uh, are aggressive. Uh, and the idea that uh, uh, listening to families is something that clinicians or carers should do uh, is a basic medical principle, really, rather than a CJD issue, but, um, which I take it you agree. <laughs> um, uh, just this is still seems to be some talk about uh, genetic side again. So I don't know, um, Mike, if you want to go back to this. Uh, um, there were things that saying that a brain autopsy was the only way to diagnose genetic prion disease. I think that obviously an autopsy is the way to definitively diagnose prion disease in general, but there are ways of determining genetic risk and genetic prion disease without an autopsy as such. Uh, on the other hand, an autopsy has certain roles. So I don't know if you want to talk about the whole role of autopsy, but also just to talk about genetic aspects as well. Yes, well, some of this question, I'd certainly like to also defer to, to Dr. Appleby, to Brian, um, since he directs the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. Uh, so, but uh, the first thing is that for genetic prion disease, we just need DNA. And the, while a person is still with us, the, probably the easiest way to get DNA is by blood sample. Um, and the DNA that's in your brain is essentially the same that's in your blood. And we can, if you have the gene, it's basically uh, in any cell in your body that has DNA. So blood is the easiest and just getting a simple blood test. And usually um, just th there are small tubes that we use for, for taking blood samples and they can be sent to a laboratory, including the um, National Print Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. And um, the, um, some laboratories can also do a saliva test where you just collect saliva and spit it into um, a tube and that gives uh, cells from the cheeks and they can extract the DNA from those cells and test for prion disease. Um, I know the NPDSC 
prefers blood. I don't even, I don't know if they take saliva samples. I don't think they're set up for that, but some labs do, but usually a blood test, which is usually very easy to get is the best way. Um, after a patient passes, if the autopsy is um, done in a certain way, meaning that usually when we do an autopsy, part of the brain tissue is frozen and part of it is put into fixative. And if there's frozen brain tissue, one can extract DNA from that. And the, um, the National Print Disease Pathology Surveillance Center does that on all of the uh, brains that they've autopsied. They extract DNA from frozen tissue and they uh, will do a genetic test on that. Um, and often that will confirm the test that was already done in blood if a patient had the blood test. A lot of times the patients didn't get the blood test while they're alive. So the only genetic test is from brain tissue. If the autopsy wasn't done correctly, um, not maybe, maybe it wasn't organized by the NPDSC or a place that knew how to manage CJD autopsies, they might not have gotten a uh, frozen tissue. And then you could not, you would not be able to usually get the DNA from the autopsy. It's much more harder to get DNA from uh, fixed uh, tissue. And then just in terms of the importance of autopsy, um, almost everything that we that all of us are speaking to you about today is because of our patients who have gotten autopsy. We everything we learn is because we can look go back and say, yes, this patient definitely had CJD. It's autopsy proven. We can actually determine there are certain subtypes of prion disease. Sometimes the pathology will tell us that, yes, it's genetic prion disease, such as um, a form such as Gerstmann-Stauscher-Scheinker or GSS. On autopsy, we can usually tell that it's GSS. But if it is other forms of genetic prion disease, sometimes we call it familial CJD, those even at autopsy are indistinguishable from sporadic disease. So unless um, the genetic testing is done, we would never know just by looking at the tissue under the microscope that it's genetic prion disease. So that's the other important reason for getting an autopsy um, is to be able to extract DNA, confirm if it is genetic or if it's uh, sporadic. Um, I'll, I'll turn to Brian uh, to go on further with that, but I think it's worth emphasizing that Yes, genetic uh, causes of prion disease can sometimes clinically look like sporadic CJD, and the pathology itself won't necessarily always tell you the difference. And of course, um, it's not always the case that there's a family history uh, in, uh, that's known. But if somebody has an illness that looks like sporadic CJD in an appropriate age group, where there's no family history, the chances of that turning out to be genetic disease are fairly low. Um, do you want to comment on that, Brian, and the role of autopsy in general? Yeah, yeah I, I agree with the earlier statement you made as well, that there are many reasons to do an autopsy, and um, the, we'll be giving an update on the Prion Center, I, I think, later this month. You'll hear about some of that. Uh, in my clinical practice, you know, we, we do discuss autopsies with families, and, and my general approach is if the family thinks that they're going to be doing an autopsy, um, there's really no need to do um, uh, blood genetic testing, because you're going to get those results with the autopsy. Um, you know, there are a couple of things that we would caution. Again, we would encourage you to use the Prion Center to um, set up the autopsy and it's done free of charge through a CDC grant that ensures that everything's done appropriately. Um, but to your other point, Richard, um, you know, most cases of genetic prion disease have a family history, but not all. And my other statement to families is if that if this is something you really want to know for sure, the only way to do that is by doing the genetic testing, either via autopsy or uh, blood. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there's talk here about getting results and so on, but I, I don't know very much about the system in the States, but presumably your genetic testing does have to have consent from somebody, doesn't it? Or is it automatically done as part of the process? No, there has to be consent from the legal yeah. next of kin. Yeah. And, um, and then the results are given to the legal next of kin. So the results are actually given to the physician that physician. is placed oh. on the autopsy consent form. And then they uh, deliver that to the legal next of kin. Uh, we've had had 
problems where um, the legal next of kin are having issues getting the results from that physician. And, um, you know, we can always change the person on that form. If you're having difficulty, just call the center, let us know. Again, it has to be the legal next of kin that uh, makes that change, but uh, we can try to help you out if you're having some difficulties. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly had difficulties where some members of the family want genetic testing and some don't, which is always a, a problem when that happens. Um, uh, I just wanted to get, maybe turn to one other uh, aspect of care. I don't know if you want to address this, Greg. I mean, we, we've talked a bit about swallowing support and we talked about it in the presentation. But um, when people do develop difficulties with swallowing, some carers are very anxious about the fact that someone might choke or inhale food or uh, fluid. Um, how do you manage that anxiety? Yeah, it's uh, another very good, very good question. I think the discussion about swallowing is one that I like to begin early uh, in in when I'm getting to know a patient and getting to know family members. And it gives me sometimes at the best of times an opportunity to actually hear from the patient how they want to manage some of these important end of life uh, issues that we can frankly expect that our patients with CJD will face. And so knowing how they want to handle that when it comes to supplemental feeding. And in my experience, most patients have been pretty clear that you know they, they want to eat things by mouth. And when they're hungry, they... They definitely want to, they're willing to accept that risk of possibly having some, some sort of aspiration event or something of the sort with that. I think we often think that if we feed somebody through a tube that we're going to reduce the risk of aspiration, but studies have actually shown in many other populations that's not the case. The food goes into the stomach, but then can still come back up and end up in the lungs and we run into all those same problems. And so I think feeding by mouth when the person is hungry, when they're alert, when they want to have food coming in is one way to reduce that risk. And another way, and this can be a service that, again, I like to access pretty early on, is engaging uh, speech language pathology, our speech therapists, who are really the swallowing experts of the healthcare team, getting them involved to assess patients who may be having some mild issues, uh, where they're most helpful is identifying, of course, what's the cause of those issues. And I think in many cases, it's because of the changes in the brain, but where they can be really useful is providing strategies and solutions to minimize the risk of aspiration. And what the simple advice they tend to provide, make sure the patient's sitting up, make sure that they're awake, alert, that the food is either cut into small sizes, sometimes pureed, uh, and then they can go beyond that. They'll tailor, tailor a management plan for families. And I think taking that really holistic approach can help to alleviate some of that anxiety and some of that concern. Um, and, and that seems to work well for most of the patients that I've, that I've cared for in their families. Thank you. There was a question here, which I um, obviously is very local to you about the CJD Foundation giving support to families and how that actually happens. And uh, someone's typed in that the hospital didn't, Put them in touch with the CJD Foundation. So I don't know if you want to comment, uh, any of you, on how families um, contact the CJD Foundation or how the Foundation can reach out to families after the diagnosis. Do any of you want to comment on that? Um, I can comment on it. Uh, you know, I think the Foundation, as well as the Prion Center, um, we really do as much as we can to try to get education out there in a variety of different aspects. And that's part of the reason why we do these recordings is people can you know, stumble across them on YouTube or what have you. Um, but even the literature, we really try hard to make awareness for the foundation and, and the Prion Center. And I know uh, Dr. Day and, and Geshwin do the same um, to really try to make awareness. And unfortunately it's a rare disease um, and so that can be difficult for the exposure. Uh, but keep in mind that this isn't unique to CJD I and mean, the Alzheimer's Association in a certain way uh, also experiences the same thing. You have this very large organization and uh, very common disease and um, sometimes they have the same difficulties. Okay, right. Um, I didn't think that there was anything specific to address in the questions otherwise, unless any of you have looked in them and want to comment on anything in particular. Yeah, this is Michael. Um, I've, I've been reading through these excellent questions and um, I, there are a lot of questions about caregiving and, uh, um, and the answers that given have all been terrific. 
I would add that um, one of the things that can be uh, helpful is to try to um, distract, if you're trying to clean or bathe somebody or they're getting agitated, is sometimes distracting a patient can be helpful. So um, if you're trying to wash them or bathe them and they're fighting, talk, you know, have the caregiver talk to them about something else, ask them some other questions. And kind of as they're um, answering the question, you might be able to begin to bathe them. Uh, sometimes music, if you find out what music a patient likes um, and putting headphones on them, that can help relax them. The, if you are uh, like YouTube, the UCSF Memory and Aging Center where, where I work, our nurses have put together a wonderful series of managing behaviors in dementia. So if you just go to YouTube and put in UCSF, all, all capitals, Memory and Aging Center, and you put that in, you'll get to our YouTube page. And we have lots of videos about how to care uh, for patients um, with, with dementia, with behavioral problems, that type of thing. Those can be helpful. And um, other organizations probably have similar videos. Mayo Clinic probably has them and, and others. So um, those resources are out there. Okay. Um, I think we're probably nearing the time, but th there have been some uh, rather um, repeated questions about tau protein. So I don't know if, um, if any of you want to address that, uh, the role of tau protein in the uh, diagnosis of CJD. I think, Greg, do you want to comment yeah, on that? Yeah, what is it, Greg? I, I think they're talking about the CSF tau. As yeah, well. no, I, I can comment on it. Uh, tau protein is... Uh, is a just it's a common protein that's found really throughout the nervous system and in a colloquial sense i often say it's like the rebar of the neurons the the cells of the brain and the spinal cord meaning that it's there for structural integrity it's spread out throughout the neuron and it helps uh, the neuron to maintain its function for signals to get down and back and for for cells to communicate it in anyone who under ha, or has a, experiences a brain injury, really of any kind, and that could be from a disease like Alzheimer's disease, it could be from a hit on the head, it could be from, I suppose, a particularly violent sneeze, or a terrible disease like CJD. If the neuronal structure is shaken up, interfered with, that tau level can go up in the spinal fluid, basically. Certainly, if brain cells like neurons are dying from a neurodegenerative disease like CJD, that level is going to go up. Where it becomes useful in CJD uh, is that it doesn't go up a little bit. It usually goes up a whole lot reflecting the degree of damage going on in the brain. And so it has been one of the markers that's been put forward as not a specific marker of CJD, but perhaps a useful one, because we have the ability to measure tau protein particularly well in the spinal fluid. And so it has become one of the biomarkers that doctors may measure and probably should measure it in concert with other biomarkers, in particular biomarkers that we think are really specific for CJD, like this RT quick measure that's available through the Prion, National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center, and sometimes 1433, which is another older measure of neuronal, neuronal injury. But where it can be useful is that in our CJD patients, that level is often very high. Not in every case, but in the majority of cases, above a level of, say, 1,200 if it's measured at, at Brian Appleby's, Appleby's Center. Um, a normal level, just for, for those, uh, those who care about those things, is probably something less than 200 in, in spinal fluid of healthy individuals. And so 1,200 is really high. Uh, but we can also see high levels of tau, as I've said, in people who have had other forms of injury, like a stroke, or even aggressive forms of Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative diseases. So a useful marker of, of neuronal degeneration, of neuronal injury, something that can be applied in CJD, but really needs to be taken in the context of everything else going on in this disease by a doctor who's paying a lot of attention to the symptoms, to the signs, and who's asking the question about whether, whether there is CJD present and using that test along with all of the other ones to help to get the best answer for our patients and families. Thank you. Um, I think we're probably coming towards the end, aren't we, Debbie? I just, there have been a few questions about, um, about treatment, but I mean, I think 
to be honest, uh, we discussed treatment in the presentation and the bottom line is at the moment, at this moment, there is no treatment which has been definitively shown to benefit uh, human beings with uh, diseases like sporadic CJD, uh, unless any of you wish to disagree with that. No, okay. Um, <laughs> right, um, that, which is obviously a very sad state of affairs, but I think that is the bottom line at the moment, uh, whatever the hopes are for the near or distant future. Um, so, uh, Debbie, would you like us to wrap up at this moment? Yeah, okay. Um, I hope we've dealt with most of the questions that you um, have put forward. Um, and thank you very much to all of the panelists uh, who dealt with many questions during the, the actual recorded presentation and then again live as well. And I hope that uh, it's been of benefit to those of you who are watching. I understand this has been recorded, is that right? Um, so it is available for reviewing uh, if you so wish. And uh, with that, then I'll wish everyone a good night or here a good morning. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> or Richard. <laughs> um, so I don't know, do you want to make any closing comments, Debbie, or you? No, okay. So thank you very much and we'll all depart then. Um, thank you. <laughs>